Welcome to COM42 Cast, the tech podcast from a neighboring galaxy. My name is Miko Pavlikovsky. Welcome to the internet. I'll be your guide. Today with me, Emily Rupp, Solutions Engineer at Jelly.io. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm great. I am wondering if you could go faster than the speed of light, where would you go? That's really, you know, literally what's on my mind right now. <laughs> uh, I would go to the Carina Nebula. It's one of the nebulas that the James Webb Telescope just took a photo of uh, that they're calling a star factory. I want to know if it looks like that in real life or if they've just digitized it to make it look, make it look like cotton candy covered in stars. What if they did? What if it's, you know, black and white? Would you be disappointed? I mean, that would be fascinating. I don't know if I would be disappointed or like privileged that I got to see it with my own eyes and like I could come back and report what nebulas actually look like to the naked human eye. I don't know that I'd be mad because they don't know, right? They, they haven't seen it with their own eyes. It's kind of their best guess. Yeah, it reminds me of, you know, the other spectrum and the sizing when you look at the electron microscope pictures and they always color them so that you can see different things. And then you realize, mm -hmm. oh, actually, <laughs> somebody just painted that. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit suspicious. I think it's kind of nice that we as people want to make stuff look pretty, like <laughs> that we color and paint in the, the things that we see in telescopes and microscopes. That's kind of That's endearing. True. <laughs> That's how our brains work anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Like every time you think about something, you recall that image and you slightly modify it. So I guess human perception, mm -hmm. <laughs> always adding stuff to what's actually objectively measurable. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, uh, of objectively measuring things, um, you work at Jelly.io and I'm pretty sure we'll completely and conspicuously wander in that, that direction at some point. But would you like to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself before we do? Sure. I'm a recovering incident commander. Um, I was an incident commander for a while. I've been doing um, incident command and response probably over um, the last like seven, eight years in my career. And I, uh, like most people who do incident response and analysis for their job, ended up here completely by accident. And I started kind of in customer facing support. I was doing weekend chats. I, I mean, I've been in tech for a, a lot longer than, than that, probably the last 15 years or so doing technical support, technical troubleshooting, things like that. And incidents were always like this kind of exciting thing for me where it was very easy for me to kind of narrow my scope and really focus on on what was going on and troubleshooting communicating asking questions because i really love asking questions and i think uh when you're in an organization and people see that you are drawn into incidents and like doing them then they're kind of like ah we've got one <laughs> Let's have this person, uh, you know, focus on incident response, help us with incident response, learn incident analysis and things like that. So um, it was kind of my side gig for a very long time. In addition to the other stuff I was doing, I've been in hundreds of incidents. That's so not hyperbolic. I've been literally in hundreds of incidents. I've written hundreds of status posts and probably hundreds of incident timelines as well. So I've done a lot of incident response and been in a lot of incident review meetings, facilitated a lot of them. And I kind of made my way into doing that as a full-time career. I, it was probably five or six years in when someone was like, yeah, and then maybe you can be like an incident commander, do this as your job. And I was like, this is a whole job. Like this is a whole career and I, I had never really been aware of that. So I stumbled kind of into it as a career and yeah, became an incident commander and then started working with Jelly. Wow. Yeah, that's not the combination of keywords that you hear very often, you know, incident and in the same sentence, words like love and excitement. You did introduce yourself as a recovering uh, incident manager. A commander, rather. Sorry, don't mean to. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> I did not choose down. that title. It's I have uh, I have no emotional attachment to being a commander. It's okay. Yeah, sounds uh, vaguely military um, mm -hmm. or navy, rather. Uh, so yeah, I actually mm -hmm. quite like that. Yes, yeah, so I can't say I necessarily share that approach to incidents. They don't necessarily invoke this, you know, feelings of excitement in me when I remember some of them. Can you tell me? why you ended up liking them. I'm guessing everybody starts with, okay, this is not particularly pleasant. It wasn't supposed to break. And now we have all this 
questions to answer to how did you go from that to oh this is fun i should do it more often i don't know i mean i've always been someone who thrives in chaos but i think that there's something like it, it really does like i can narrow in my focus because when an incident is happening all of the other things that you have in the day-to-day of what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do everything else falls away and your main focus is what do we need to solve this problem what are the what are the people need who are trying to solve this problem what do they need how can i help them how can i communicate this information to folks who might be impacted by this issue like it just i don't know it feels like a very kind of i am understand that we have a problem to solve and our goal is to solve that problem and i'm there to help facilitate that in any way i can and it just kind of feels like a real um almost like i have blinders on it it helps me focus because the most urgent possible thing is solving this and i think that me starting to love it kind of came from the people that i was working with and mm-hmm. realizing that it didn't have to be this like horrible slog every time we were in an incident we could joke and have fun and keep the mood light and actually we would be better at response we would be able to respond to things quicker and like stay in facilitating conversation if we were having a good time with each other and so that's kind of something that i started enjoying doing and bringing into incidents is just kind of helping folks take a deep breath and and move through this because it's not incidents really are just high, it's high stakes troubleshooting it's things that every engineer has those skills to be able to understand there is a problem in my code and i need to figure out what's going on so that i can fix it that's a regular mm-hmm. thing that we do it's just kind of reframing incidents as this is we're just troubleshooting it just feels absolutely terrifying because there's customer impact and there's a lot of people at the company watching and and seeing what we're doing and kind of my role in that is helping make the rest of that fade away so that they can focus on the problem at hand and feel like they know what they're doing almost more as like a camp counselor or cheerleader than commander was kind of always how I phrased it that's why <laughs> commander is not a title I'm emotionally attached to because experts the folks who write the code and are in the problems they know what they're doing they just need help with the rest of it and getting through it what you're describing almost sounds like and perhaps not almost perhaps entirely sounds like you know what athletes are experiencing when they're about to hit that ball or you know start that run or mm-hmm. do this race right when they and everything else kind of fades away and you focus on one thing so i guess is that the state of flow really that's that's appealing to that that's mm-hmm. or is it the satisfaction from actually knowing okay this looks horrible but i'm going to solve it i've died a hundred times before I think it's it's the flow and there's also that kind of like you're going to get it. You don't really have an option to not solve this problem. You have to fix this issue so that I mean you might not be able to fix it in the most beautiful, complex, complete way. It could be that you are just slapping duct tape on so that the boat doesn't sink so that you can get to shore, but you're going to solve that problem. And when you solve that problem, you're going to get that rush of dopamine. So you have like the adrenaline and, you know, the the problem solving. You're working together. It's a team sport and then you're going to get to a point where you have fixed something and you're going to get that rush of I mean, I think there is like a literal like body chemistry like it's a little addicting because it's you're getting that rush and you're getting that kind of lift from solving the problems if anybody ever manages to make a graph of people's motivations i think a lot of that would be dopamine in various forms including your incidents so tell me obviously you know from what you're describing it sounds like incidents response is not a solved problem right we're not all enlightened to a point where we all do perfectly well on that so what do you think is broken about how we do incidents in broad strokes as um, an industry i think a, a little bit has to do with how we think about them i think that a, a lot of we think of incidents as this horrible thing that have happened to us um and that we have to react to that we have to solve the problem once the problem is solved we have to make sure that it never happens again and i think that that's really an outdated look a way to look at incidents because incidents are a good sign engineering in like in tech and whole move move fast and break things right that's that's kind of the the phrase that our, a lot of our engineering organizations are focused on move fast and break things and when you break things you learn how that thing came together and 
the way that we're kind of thinking about incidents as this thing breaks, we fix it, we make sure it never happens again, and then we never think about it again is kind of backwards because our systems are way too complex to be that like straightforward with how problems occur, right? This one incident will have, you know, five or six different contributing factors. We might not be able to fix all of these different individual things in the grand scheme of things. So we put a fix in place at the sharp end so that it doesn't happen immediately in this specific way. This impact doesn't recur because of things that have gone on. But the entire organization, like your entire socio-technical system, the people that work with it and the technical, they've all changed. The fabric of this entire reality is now different. So to think that we can now go back to where we were when we started, we've solved it and now we've returned to, to a zero place that's kind of naive, right? Instead, we're operating in a new reality and we've had this event that we've already paid the price for. You know, we bought a $400 juicer, we bought a Peloton, we bought a very expensive treadmill and we said, ooh, this is hard. It's a lot of work for me, so I'm not going to spend a lot more time doing this when in reality, we're now leaving money on the table because there's a cost to incidents, right? In response in what our customers are impacting and I'm like actual money in, in the tools and things that we are paying for to actually fix the problems. To not sit and invest time in learning how do our people work together when they're trying to respond to a problem? How do our systems work together in, in the ways that we didn't understand previously that this that we were able to get to this issue? We're approaching these as kind of problems to solve as opposed to like these rife opportunities to understand the whole fabric, the weave, how everything connects in our systems to update our mental model of how everything comes together and works. So I think that we view incidents as problems to solve as opposed to these incredible, like these just huge opportunities for us to delve into, discover insights about how things work and how they maybe could work differently or how they really actually work as opposed to the way that we say that they work or the way that we think mm. that they work. So I think that they're kind of this magic portal into how things are really transpiring. And I think that a lot of times we miss out on digging into that because we don't want to think about it anymore. <laughs> it's this hard thing and we've solved it. And so I don't want to think about it anymore. Right. So I think completely incidentally, that's basically the first thing Jelly. that one sees when they go to jelly.io, right? I don't mean the magic portal. I don't think they said that, but not no. incidents, <laughs> opportunities. Is that like the biggest selling point? Is that really what you're trying to change? The perception? of the incidents as learning opportunities versus, you know, a terrible thing? Yeah, I, I think like when it comes down to it, I mean, it's obviously we are um, working on the whole thing, both response and analysis, but I think it's really just, it doesn't need to be as hard or as bad as I think a lot of folks perceive it to be. Actually, when I was trying to decide whether I wanted to become a full-time incident commander, I had a conversation with my brother who I've actually worked with for a long time too. And I was like, I don't know, this is kind of scary. This is like choosing a career path. And he was like, well, what do you care about? What do you want to do? Um, and I said, I just, I don't want it to be so hard for everyone. Like I, like when you go through an incident, I don't want everyone to have as bad of a time as they're having. I want it to be easier. I want it to be accessible because it's not this difficult, scary thing it really can be something that you enjoy and something that you get something out of. And I was like, well, it seems like maybe you should do this <laughs> as your job then. But I think that that's, I mean, that's what drew me to, to want to come work at Jelly is I really do believe in the, the fact that like responding to incidents and learning from incidents doesn't need to be this painful, difficult thing. And it doesn't need to be this kind of like, horrible process that's being inflicted on you it can be like a really interesting and enjoyable experience especially when it comes to learning new things and discovering new stuff that you didn't know about the people that you work with and the, and the tech that you work with that makes sense i was wondering if you could share some interesting anecdotes like if you were to pick like your most favorite incident ever that was maybe the most entertaining or most unexpected and obviously don't name companies or anything like that but um which incident would you name you know your number one most favorite 
That's really hard. This is actually a question I used to ask in interviews is tell me about your favorite incident. So I love the way that you <laughs> phrased this because um, I think a lot of people immediately go mentally to like the worst incident they've ever been a part of, which isn't the question. It's what's your favorite one? And I have so many favorites. I have so many incidents that like I'm now like emotionally bonded with those people. We have friendships for life out of those incidents. Um, <laughs> though I would say my favorite one has to be, uh, there was an incident uh, where I was at a company. I wasn't even an incident commander yet at this point, um, but I was on call for incidents. And it was at the entire company kickoff. So multiple people from all over the country had been brought together to do like our kickoff for the company. And we were on the 24th floor in a ballroom in a very fancy hotel having like a like a dinner. And it was, it was very fancy. And it was a junior engineers first time on call they got paged there was an incident and we kind of swarmed at a table and it was really cool because it was people who wouldn't ever actually get to sit next to each other physically during an incident because mm -hmm. we worked in different states um, that were all around a table working together on this incident the only incident where we've had a professional photographer present um uh, which I recommend because we do have some really awesome pictures that look kind of like uh, Renaissance paintings of folks working together uh, on this incident. But it was just really cool. It was a very cool experience to physically get to sit together with everyone because I've worked at a lot of distributed companies and walk around the table, swap beers out for water and have people then immediately swap water back for beer, make sure kind of we were all eating. And it was it was really interesting because I don't think everybody else noticed either that this was happening. There was an incident going on. I think at one point someone got up and to speak and was like, hey, come on, guys, pay attention. And we were like, we're actively responding to an incident right now. Like, what? Is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, we got it. We're just going to keep sitting at this table and working on this. And it was really cool. It was a really pleasant experience. It was also kind of magical for that engineer who was on call for the first time. He was like a junior dev, first, first on call shift ever. And everyone was there to physically support them and, and get them through the incident. It was just like a really neat opportunity to all be sitting together and served a very fancy meal while we fixed a problem. I'm bringing like bags of flame and hot Cheetos to people when, when there's an incident. Instead, we have some like fancy crudite and, and hors d'oeuvres being delivered to us. It's pretty fancy too. I love it. That's going to be my benchmark going forward. When I ask other people, they'll be like, oh no, that, that wasn't that special. Come on. You didn't even have a ballroom. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And maybe another to extract from you since I've got you here. So if you were to like pick maybe top one or two elements that you see probably the most uh, that occur in most of those incidents, what would you say? It's probably the ones to always check out just in case. Any commonalities that are very visible from your experience? Um, yeah, there's actually some really interesting ones that I feel like we as an industry haven't yet really figured out how to navigate in the best possible way. Um, vendor incidents are always really interesting when a third party provider, because we, I mean, tech is now, we're built upon each other, right? We have so much of each other in the tech stack that we're using and being able to collaborate with each other across like company boundaries as incidents are happening is not something that we've quite fully figured out how to do. And I'm really interested to see how we start moving on that because it's a, a large reality in a lot of our lives where, oh, this vendor is down and my options are, do we pay an entire other vendor to provide the service for us now? Do we try and set that up and integrate it? Do we just kind of put our hands in the air and say like, we are at the mercy of this vendor's incidents. And we're just going to wait for them to come back in line. Like it's a really interesting dynamic. I feel like a lot of organizations too, when it's a vendor incident, they don't spend a lot of time analyzing our response or how we got to this position because, you know, we can kind of very easily say like, oh, well, this vendor went down, it's not our fault. When in reality, there's always a lot to inspect about how are we integrated with this? Do we understand all of the different ways and different places that all of our different teams are integrated with this? Because it's very rarely straightforward. Everyone's using this thing in the same way and kind of understanding what our options are around that. And the next is like our own internal tooling. Everybody's made their own stuff, um, and it's usually a second-class citizen. I'm going to be honest, most of the internal tools that we make for ourselves are not things that we upkeep. And it's usually really hard to get business prioritization to 
maintain and upgrade and make all of our internal tools that we use operating in the way that we need to, or even if we understand how they operate, because they were made seven years ago by somebody who doesn't work here anymore. So it's kind of that inherited knowledge seems to be like a, a roadblock or a difficulty that we're running into. And it's oftentimes really hard to prioritize engineers spending time understanding things so that they know how they work and they can work on them to fix them. So those are my top two. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So I think it's time for us to plug Jelly a little bit. So for everybody who's been thinking, okay, well, obviously this person knows what they're talking about. So I guess their company must be pretty good at that. How did they get started? Where do they go? What do they do? Yeah, jelly.io is our website. And our entire goal is to make incidents, incident response and learning from incidents more accessible, something that you can actually do and isn't hard or difficult. And um, right now we have our IR bot is available for free. I said right now, just in general, we offer our incident response bot for free. We really feel like, tab like incident response bots are table stakes for every organization, just a way to get everybody in the same place and update folks that are not involved in the immediate response as to what's going on. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I've been on multiple teams that have bought, built internally multiple incident response bots. So we're offering ours for free. And we also have a two-week free trial to use our incident analysis tool in Jelly. So our bot will get you through the incident, um, help you communicate stuff out, and then it will take everything that was in that Slack channel that for your incident response, and you can grab things from all sorts of other Slack channels where response kind of unfolded. Pull that into Jelly, and we help you tell the story of your incidents by building the timeline and kind of finding some themes and takeaways so that you can understand what happened a little bit more and help your organization learn from this event that you've already invested time and money in. And that's jelly.io, where everybody can find that. Emily, this has been really fun, but before I let you go, I wanted to ask you a question that I actually ask a lot of our guests because the responses are so fun and so varied. If you were to pick a single thing that you've done for yourself, for your career particularly, that provided you the highest return on investment, and it could be anything from a habit you picked up to a book you read, what would be the one thing that you would recommend other people try to? This is going to be such an embarrassing response. Have you seen the show Ted Lasso? I did. You have? Okay. There's a quote in Ted Lasso that's, be curious, not judgmental. And I use that on a constant basis. It has served me really well, especially for when I'm sitting being like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it like this? How could you think this was a good idea? Um, <laughs> I just kind of put on that be curious, not judgmental cap because I don't have all of their context. I don't know. You know, they are making the best decision they have available to them, with the information that they have. And I have found that approaching Everything, not just incidents and incident analysis, but working with other people that I don't know very well, getting to know engineers. I've had a lot of situations where I'm meeting someone for the first time in the middle of an incident. And like that's that's been a really regular thing for me in my career. So approaching folks with that kind of curiosity and grace as opposed to judgment, because I don't know everything that's going on, but I want to is really an incredible way to start building trust which I find has been the most valuable thing in my entire career is getting to know people, trying to understand the situation they're currently working in and existing in, in order to, to find out how we can best work together and help each other has been for me. I mean, all of my, my career has come out of me being in the right place in the right time and being incredibly lucky because someone has said like, Oh, Emily can do that. So that's what I found. Be curious, not judgmental, try and make friends, and at the very least, try and kind of understand what people are going through so that you can work the best with them. Amazing response. And amazing show. And look, people are already it quoting is. that for life wisdom. And it hasn't yeah. even been that long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Emily, last question. For everybody who wants to follow your adventures, uh, where do they find you? Twitter, GitHub? I'm on Twitter with the mortal Emily, like immortal em Emily, like a like mortal enemy, <laughs> the mortal Emily. It's a play on my own name. Um, and I will mostly tweet about like movies and then analyzing those movies as incidents because it's a problem that I have. <laughs> 
Fantastic. All right. Emily Rupp, everybody, solutions engineer at Jelly today.